welcome to another episode of Conversations with Coleman. My guest today is Paul Bloom. Paul Bloom is a renowned psychologist, professor, and author currently teaching at Yale University and University of Toronto. He's published many books, including Descartes' Baby, How Pleasure Works, Just Babies, Against Empathy, The Sweet Spot, and the topic of today's conversation, Psych, the Story of the Human Mind. In this episode, we'll be discussing a broad summary of the field and findings of psychology, touching on its various branches and exploring the complexities of human behavior. We talk about whether psychology is a real science. We talk about the reality of the unconscious mind. We talk about the legacy of Freud, the advantages of self-delusion. We talk about the hard problem of consciousness. We discuss artificial intelligence and its implication for rival theories of human language and for the future of art. We talk about the potential dangers of AI misalignment. We talk about the definition of intelligence. We discuss nature versus nurture and much more. So without further ado, Paul Bloom. Okay, Paul Bloom, thanks so much for coming on my show. Uh, thanks for having me here, Coleman. As I just to told to you. you offline, I've been a longtime admirer of yours, read many of your books going back, at least in my life, at least six or seven years. Um, so it's it's great to get you on this show. And I've heard you on many podcasts, including The Very Bad Wizards, uh, Sam Harris, oh, yeah. and, uh, and, and others. So I think some of my fans will be familiar with with you from those books and those podcast appearances. Um, but you, the occasion of this podcast is, is you have a great new book out, which is, I think, broader in scope than any of your other books um, called Psych, which is basically a, you know, a, a summary of, you know, all of the solid empirical findings of the science of psychology um, up to the modern day, including some of the history of science story about how psychology has evolved over the past, you know, hundred to two hundred years or so. So it's a it's a really big think book that is probably the best you know, introductory book to psychology, you know, broadly that I could think of. And it's it's a uh, it's really I'm really glad that you were the person uh, to write this kind of book. So I, we won't cover everything in there today, but I can really recommend to my followers, go out and buy this book, Psych. Thanks very much. That means a lot. You're, you're right. This is by far the biggest book I've ever written, both sort of physically in size. It's kind of a heavy one. And, um, and also in scope. My other books tended to push a particular argument, like uh, you know the morality of babies or the problems with empathy. This book is meant to, as you say, just cover all of psychology. It's it's not supposed to be a textbook. I, it would kill mm -hmm. me to write a textbook. They're boring. They're difficult to read. It, it's it's meant to be a fun way to introduce yourself to, at a pretty high level to yeah. everything in psych. So yeah, to talk about. So let's just start big picture. You know, me me and my girlfriend mm -hmm. have a joke that psychology is a fake science. Um, she's <laughs> <laughs> some some joke. Yeah, it's more hurtful. more of just a straight up <laughs> non funny insult than a joke. Yeah. But she she comes from a neuroscience background, and and we we have grown up in the age of fad psychology of the sort that I talked about in my podcast with Jenny Jesse Single a, a while mm -hmm. ago of you know TED talks demonstrating. F you know, so-called psychological effects that don't replicate. Um, and in a general background where things like physics, sciences like physics have seem to have just more solid predictive power in some ways uh, compared to the softer sciences like psych. So combine all these factors and one can get the impression that uh, the psych major in, on a college campus is doing something less serious than the physics major. <laughs> I, I rarely start out a, an interview by insulting my entire guests of uh, field. No, I, 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 I like but that. I like can that. you say something in, in defense of psychology as a real science with a capital S? Yeah. Um, well, 
<laughs> First thing, in, in, in kind of an equally pugnacious mode, we could talk mm. about neuroscience and, uh, and the replication crises that have hit neuroscience and difficulties in that area. But you, you said a lot of tough things about psychology. I think each and every one of them is true. We're certainly not a science in the sense that physics or chemistry is a science, a developed science with enormous theoretical power to explain and predict the world. We're very far from that. We are also an area where there's a lot of hucksters and shams and failures to replicate and poor studies. Um, there's a lot, you know, particularly the sort of psychology that, that hits the popular press. A lot of it's terrible. There's enormous motivations to tell people, here's how to cure your mental illness. Here's how to um, be happy. Here's how to succeed at school and work. And these things get blown out of proportion. And most, much of what you hear, say, in a TED Talk or in a, a popular article shouldn't be trusted. So all of that's true. But I wouldn't have written a book if I believed that the story ended there. I think that psychology, though it suffers from all sorts of problems of replication and the scope of our analyses and so on, has made some extraordinary discoveries, discoveries that have changed the way we think about the world, discoveries that have a difference and makes a difference in people's lives. I'll just give two examples. One example from work I've been involved with myself is there's been some striking discoveries about what babies know, suggesting that the story that somebody like Plato or Descartes or Kant would have, where there's built-in inborn knowledge of physical social world, is basically true. The empiricists were wrong. We come into the world with some understanding of it. And a second example I'll give you is memory, which is there's a very common sense notion of memory, which is when you remember the world, you have this veridical tape recording of it. And then maybe you, you lose track of it, and, and then a, a helpful therapist or, or a competent police investigator will bring it back to you. Turns out it's not true at all. Memory is largely a reconstruction of the world. And... Um, and so we get psychologists can easily implant false memories. Most of what you're sure about in the past is, is almost mm. certainly false. And there's good research on that. And I could go on. I could go on to other discoveries. Um, it is a surprise to many people how much of human differences is caused by genes. And it's maybe even more of a surprise how much of human differences is caused by factors out that aren't that are environmental but don't have to mm -hmm. do with the family. So we we have our discoveries. We ha we 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 we've earned our keys. Yeah. Some so I guess let's uh, let let's sort of talk about some of the major strains of psychological thought, beginning with Freud. You kind of structure the book as a commentary on Freud, a commentary on Skinner, um, a commentary on um, Piaget. Is, I hope I'm pronouncing that right. So yeah. let's start with Freud. As you say in the book, Freud is probably the one psychologist that almost everyone listening to this podcast has heard of. And they've heard the words Freudian, and they've probably heard the words Oedipus complex, and they probably have some notion of the Oedipus, Oedipus complex, meaning that men want to kill their fathers and marry their mothers, and the notion of an unconscious mind and the image of a patient leaning back on a couch, having a therapist sort of analyze them. So, you know, who was Freud and what is his legacy? Was he a crackpot that should be relegated to the dustbin of history? Was he right about everything or is the truth somewhere in between? Yeah, somewhere in between. Um, you know, there, there are friends of mine who, who look at my book and say, that's a great book. Why'd you waste a chapter on Freud? And at the same time, I get, I get emails saying, you talked about Freud, but you didn't talk about his famous student, mm -hmm. Jung. You only didn't devote too much energy to him. Mm -hmm. Nobody's happy with, with Freud. And my take on Freud is that on the one hand, just about everything he said was false. There's not much evidence in the oral stage and the anal stage and the Oedipus complex and penis envy and all that stuff. That's just, just bogus. His theories of mental illness are... Um, unscientific and unsupported. He, he, just about everything he said was mistaken. But I think Freud is an extremely important figure. One reason what you mentioned, which is his cultural importance. You know, you just got to, you got to know Freud. Freud shaped how a lot of us think about the mind. Um, but another reason is that despite getting everything specific wrong, I think he got the biggest thing right 
which is the power of the unconscious. So Freud was not the first to think about the unconscious, but he pushed it to a greater extent than anybody else and made the argument that a lot of our fundamental decisions, what job to do, who we fall in love with, who we hate, who we, who we, who we interact with, is shaped by factors outside of our control. And modern psychologists reject everything else having to do with Freud. But we accept that. I, I know political psychologists, and they say, we're really interested in why some people voted for Trump and other people voted for Biden. And you might think, well, just ask people, and they'll tell you. But nobody would take that seriously, because they, they sort of would say, look, even putting aside the fact that people lie, you could be motivated to vote for Trump or Biden for reasons entirely out of your knowledge, mm -hmm. out of your control. You might think you voted for the guy for one reason, but actually mm -hmm. did it for another. And so too for every other aspect of your life. So that's what Freud got right. And in, in some way, the entire cognitive bias literature, you know, whether these results replicate or not, let's just, you know, f for the sake of argument, say they do, the concept that I'm more attracted to the same woman if she's wearing a red dress for some reason. Red is just a sort of magic color in terms of human sexual drives or if you're standing on a bridge and and the bridge is swaying back and forth and you have a conversation with someone you subconsciously mistake your fear of falling off the bridge for an attraction yeah. to the person because you know your heart is pumping and and that makes you more attracted to the same person uh, more than you would be had you just met them on the sidewalk i mean all of can all of that be seen as yet more vindication of the fact that we have an um, unconscious or subconscious mind and that it really does influence our conscious mind and our behavior and decisions so forth? It could be. I'm kind of, as you know from the book, I'm kind of skeptical about a lot of that implicit mm -hmm. priming stuff. It's very, very much in vogue that, you know, um, you have a vote inside a school that makes you support school policies more. You know, you're, you're, um, you just washed mm -hmm. your hands. You're, um, more strict about sexual morality. Um, there's a lot, there's so many sexy findings like this. And you're right, they kind of have a Freudian flavor to them, where something outside your control, you don't, no awareness of has, has, has moved you. I don't think that mm. kind of work holds up. But I think what does hold up is the idea that even for, exper for, for decisions that might seem deliberative and contemplative, we're often drawn by factors out of our control. And, um, and the factors don't have to be, you know, a woman's wearing a red dress or something like that, a funny smell in the room. They, they could be factors from your past. It, I mean, one way to look at it is, you know, suppose I asked you, why do you have podcasts? I mean, I'm sure you haven't answered that. You, you had, you've been asked that a hundred times. You mm -hmm. haven't been answered that. And suppose I kind of had a good look at your life and somebody asked me, why does this guy have a podcast? So we both come up with our answers. Common sense says your answer is going to be better than my answer because you mm -hmm. really know. It's you after all. Freud says that could be wrong. Freud said that you have no privilege access. And it could possibly be that me or your shrink has a better sense of what you're up to than you yourself. And that's a really humbling notion. I've had experiences in life which vindicate that in the sense of I can think of off the top of my head in my adult life two moments where I spontaneously burst into tears for reasons I had no idea about in the moment and only after could, could piece together. So I'll, I'll give one example yeah. where my, my mother died when I was 18 and it was a very difficult and formative experience for me taking care of her as she got cancer and her body changed and she eventually died. And years later, probably probably five years later, I had an experience where for the first time I was taking care of my girlfriend through a health, uh, a health scare that she had. And I was, you know, I was very supportive and um, felt in control of the situation, though it was sort of something of an emergency, not a life-threatening one. And at the end of it, when she got a surgery and everything went well, I just, I, we were fighting about something totally yeah. unrelated. We were having a totally separate fight. And all of a sudden I just break out into uncontrollable tears, absolutely uncontrollable yeah. tears. And I realized after the fact that the experience of taking care of her reminded me so much 
of taking care of my mother. And that's the only explanation for, I'm not a person known to just burst into tears like that. Right. And that's, there's one other situation uh, that happened too, but this is, um, I think many people will have similar experiences where an outside perspective has as much information or knowledge about you, or at least could in principle, as you have of, as you have of yourself. That's right. And I think that that's, that's, that's a deep point that I, I, my, my example is there was an appointment, you know, I was supposed to go to and I missed it. And then I made another reschedule. I put in my calendar, Mm. very clear. And then the day goes by and just don't go. And at one point, somebody who's close to me says, why don't you want to go to that appointment? And I think, no, I I want to go to that appointment. It's it's really, I really want to talk to this person. And I I plainly (laughs) didn't. And as I think everybody, every sort of contemplative person has always, now this doesn't mean uh, that the sort of more florid Freudian stuff about, oh, you know, no, it's not really you were traumatized by death of your mother, mm-hmm. you were in love of your mother. And you, I, I think mm-hmm. a lot of that's nonsense. But, but, but you're, it's a nice example of how when you burst into tears, you were, you, there were things going on inside you that you were not at the mm-hmm. time aware of. And then only later. And if you and you might have been a particularly dense person, your girlfriend mm-hmm. might have pointed this out. I wonder this is reminding you of when mm-hmm. you took care of your mother. And so so that that stuff Freud got got right. Right. This is uh what we're talking about in some way is self-deception, which is uh you know, I think a fundamental part of human psychology and um the, you know, I, I know you know Robin Hansen and uh, I think it was in Kevin Simler's book, The Elephant in the Brain, which is mm-hmm. all about self-deception and how ubiquitous it is. Can you talk a little bit about the logic of self-deception? Because naively, I would think it would always be better to know exactly what's in my mind, right? You, you would yeah. think that. That would yeah. make sense. Yet there are all these situations in everyday life where it's actually better for my self-interest to not know what's going on under my own hood. So what is that about? Yeah. It's it's such a neat it's such a neat set of questions and cuts across philosophy and psychology and all sorts of domains. Um, th- this comes into why do we have an unconscious in the first place? And the sort of standard answer is, well, you have so much so much stuff going on. You can't conscious is a li- conscious is a limited resource. It can't take on too much. You know, I can listen to a podcast in one ear. I can listen, but I and I put on a different podcast in the second ear. I could flip back and forth, but my con I just can't absorb them both. I'm, I'm, my powers are limited. But this evolutionary biologist, Robert Rivers, one of the most creative people in the field, um, had a better idea. And he said, part of what goes on to keep things unconscious is that it's adaptive. And the logic of the adaptation there is that it's, it helps you deceive people. So suppose, suppose we were in a confrontation and I wanted to persuade you that I'm not going to back down. And we were a physical conference, very serious one. Right? Well, how can I best persuade you of that? The answer seems to be for me to honestly believe I'm not going to back down, even if I actually will. Because then you're looking at my face, you're scanning me for lies, you're looking at my emotions, and I am a man who's not going to back down. And because I fooled myself into believing it so. Or, or on the flip side, imagine you want to persuade somebody you're head over heels in love with them. That's the best way to persuade somebody. To Really believe that you're head over heels in love with someone. And so deception could evolve, self-deception could evolve as a trick in order to deceive others. It's kind of like a poker game, which is, you know, suppose I'm bluffing and I have like a 2-7 offsuit and I have a re- and my face just bleeds out everything I know. What I would love for the moment when I'm facing everybody else is to be confused and think I have two aces. Because then, you know, no one's going to think I'm bluffing, not with this face. And so self-deception is a way to, to, to fool others. That was Trivers' claim. And Trivers was an evolutionary psychologist. So when he says it's a way to fool others, he doesn't mean it's a way that smart, clever people, a, a mode we click on in order to achieve our goals. He means it's an evolved setting, essentially, that we have um, and that our ancestors that were better at self-deception or had, 
you know, better settings at self-deception left more of those genes um, in the gene pool. And that's how we came to be how we came to be, right? That's the argument. And and the argument is, that's right. So the argument is, even for non-human animals, you see similar examples. Um, I think he gives the example of, of a, a jackrabbit being chased by a predator and it's bouncing back and forth. And if at any point prior to it moving back and forth, it knew what it was going to do next, it could give it away in its posture right. and it'd be lunch. So there's some advantages of putting information on a need-to-know basis. Um, for people, the argument is that certain otherwise paradoxical emotional expressions or emotional feelings, like losing your temper or falling head over heels in love, exist partially because they are sort of signals to other people that, that actually persuade to other people that you're doing what you're doing, but it works best if you believe it. So in some way, evolution has evolved us from certain confrontations to just mm-hmm. lose our temper. And then the other person sees us losing and says, wow, this person mm-hmm. really isn't going to back down. Even if under the surface there's some calculations going on where the person says, yeah, if things get, get a bit too right. heavy, I'm going to go around. And yeah, so Trivers gets that. The insight. analogy I thought of when reading this was of basketball crossovers. I don't know if you're a basketball fan at all, but not, yeah, not but enough. I mean, Go ahead. It, it would work in soccer too, I guess. But you know, ankle breakers are a big phenomenon in basketball where I'll fake going to the right convincingly mm-hmm. to get my defender to bite, and then I'll go left. And if you do this effectively enough, the defender sometimes actually falls down because they've they can't they try to switch directions faster than their body allows. And these are like the yeah. elicit the oohs and the ahs. And this is a very coveted moment in basketball. And Allen yeah. Iverson was excellent at it, Tim Hardaway. And now there are modern people like, um, like James Harden and others who are sort of known for this. But the, the best crossovers are the ones that are not planned by the person doing it. It's when I have yes. every intention of going to my right to the basket and then I get blocked and, immediately instantaneously go the other way um so those are really the best crossovers are the ones that are not even planned that's right that's right because those are the most honest signals that 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 can't be faked in in a way that's right the best bluff in the world is some poker player who's nearsighted with with dirty glasses and he looks at his pair of twos and thinks he's holding two aces (laughs) and you know goes all in and then, and then people who are extremely good at sussing out their intentions look into this guy and say, he, ha- he has the nuts. He has right. this great hand. And yeah, exactly. Same. So your example is exactly right. That's the, you, you don't fake right. Yeah. You really go right with all the intentions of going right. right. And then something happens. So th- this brings up uh, another question, which is about consciousness itself, the hard problem of consciousness and... Uh, and how to reconcile that with evolutionary psychology. So what we've been talking about here is that we have a conscious mind and an unconscious mind, a mind we're aware of and a mind we, we actually can't sense but is there. Uh, and one of the great problems in the philosophy of mind is what Chalmer called, uh, David Chalmers called the hard problem of consciousness, which is why there is anything it's like to be a person at all, why there's any feeling or awareness associated with the physical processes of any part of the brain, right? Um, Yeah. Like we assume that my laptop is not feeling anything, right? That there's no consciousness, there's no awareness in the laptop. Um, But for some reason, when you put, neurons together in a certain configuration, the lights come on and there's something it's like to be this collection uh, of cells. Yeah. But, you know, it would seem from the perspective of evolutionary psychology that consciousness as an adaptation wouldn't be advantageous or, or necessary, right? Or at least at one level, right? Like opposable thumbs help us do stuff. Intelligence helps yeah. us do stuff. But what does awareness in addition to all the competence get us, yeah. right? So do you, do you view the hard problem of consciousness through the lens of evo-psych as well? And, and what do you think the current status of 
thinking um, is on that problem? Yeah, it's a good set of questions. And I think you're, you, you nicely use a phrase like levels. Um, so some notions of consciousness make perfect sense from an adaptive point of view. So what you mean by consciousness is that some bits of information get so you could contemplate them and ruminate them and talk about them and understand what other people talk about. You know, it's, that's what some people mean by it's conscious. Like right now my blood pressure isn't conscious, but, um, but the fact that my microphone's in front of me, that is conscious. I could just mm-hmm. tell you about it and tell a story, write it. Yeah. That makes perfect sense. That's good. For, a communicating animal would want to be able to, to talk about what it's aware of. It, it's, it's essential for, for animals to feel pleasure and pain for all sorts of simple adaptive reasons. Like, you know, you burn your hand on a stove, you avoid the stove, you know, food tastes good, so you eat more of it and so on. And that keeps an animal going. But the question that remains is, why does it have to feel like something? Like, why isn't it enough that I touch something, go, ow, ow, and then stay away? But of course, that description is incomplete. There's also the actual physical feeling of it, the pain, the pleasure of, of, of having, you know, eating, an, eat, eating some ice cream when, you, when it's a hot day out and you're hungry, you know, holding your newborn against your chest, you know, the first kiss, slamming your hand in the car door. These all have what philosophers call qualia. And where does that come from? And the way you frame it is is kind of a common answer, which might be right. It comes from neurons. You get the neurons piled up in just the right way, the glial cells, the blood rushing, and out comes consciousness. And another way of putting it is when the computations become of a certain sort, then you get consciousness. And this is, of course, is a matter of, of actual real importance as computers get smarter and smarter. So I don't think my the GPT four that I run on my computer and use it to to write funny limericks and everything. I don't think it's conscious, but at a certain point, when it starts getting say smarter than I am, and is eloquent and seemingly empathic and understanding, and I'm talking to it, I'm talking to it like I'm talking to you. I'm talking to you. I assume you're conscious. Now you made it of flesh and blood, so that's a good inference, but. There may be a point where, where we're almost forced to at least confront the question of, can a computer not made out of flesh be conscious? And I don't have the foggiest idea mm-hmm. what the answer will be. Yeah, I, was, I remember being influenced by, by Colin McGinn's book um, on this, yeah. where he basically says that you know, when the brain tries to understand itself, it's going to reach a limit and you you make kind of reference to a similar idea in the book which is that we might there might be some mysteries that our brain as a tool is ill-suited to actually solving um, because we just actually can't grok it we can't understand it much like chickens can't understand calculus right presumably there may be questions we can ask but can't answer because they're ill-posed or they're we're just not actually the kinds of creatures that could even understand the answer if we heard it. I mean, and more yeah. and more, I think consciousness yeah. is that kind of problem, the hard problem that is. He gets, he gets the idea from Chomsky who distinguishes puzzles mm-hmm. from mysteries and puzzles are like really hard. Like, you know, I don't know, how does gravity work? And, and um, how do you, how do you build a machine to go as fast as light or how do you do that? And they're really, really good and, and, and it might take centuries, but you know what you're up to, you know what the problem is. You know, you know what, you know what it means to solve it for consciousness. A lot of people would argue that we don't even know what an explanation would look like. Um, it connects to questions, similar question, but free will and so on. So, so Chomsky and followed by McGinn believes that, that, that the funny feeling we get when we have no idea is the feeling that a calculus gets when looking at the, cal- <laughs> the feeling that a chicken gets when looking at a calculus text, you know, it's just, it's not, it, it's just, Beyond mm-hmm. our powers. Now, I don't know. I mean, I, I certainly think that's true. We're finitary beings. We're not angels. And so there's going to be some problems that are just too hard for us. You know, if there's problems that are too hard for a chicken and problems that are too hard for a dog, there's going to be problems that are too hard for a human. Though one could wonder how we do supplement it by the proper AI. But I just think as a sort of a strategy, you got to keep mm-hmm. plugging away. And, you know, sometimes it could be surprising. 
you might be able mm-hmm. to solve something. Yeah. So let's pivot a little bit. We've talked about chat GPT or GPT-4 now and, and Noam Chomsky. And this brings a set of questions that, uh, that I've been thinking about and many have been thinking about in the past few months as we've had so many revelations with first GPT, chat GPT, 3.5 and, and so forth. We're now, we've now encountered an artificial intelligence that, that just can speak and understand English as well as, you know, the large majority of, of English speakers. I think that's yeah. now undeniable, though some have tried to deny it, I think. And, and in fact, a few weeks ago, there was an article by none other than Noam Chomsky, the father of modern linguistics, in which he 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 seemed to allege that chat GPT could not answer certain kinds of questions. And then almost within minutes, people posed those question, questions to chat GPT and it did a very good job of, of answering them. Yeah. So, and I, I suspect this was because chat GPT refutes certain aspects of, of some, some of Chomsky's ideas. And I think you'll, you'll be able to explain to me if that's true. My broader question here is, does chat GPT, a GPT-4, it's, it's extraordinary proficiency with language. Does it change or challenge any long held beliefs about how humans acquire language? Does it in any way inform the longstanding debates on how human beings acquire language? I think it does. Um, I'll, I'll say, you know, I was, I was, uh, I went to graduate school at MIT. I took courses with Chomsky. My dissertation was on language development from very much of a Chomsky perspective. I have um, enormous respect for his work. And though I, I thought the New York Times article was, was pretty bad. It was very glib and dismissive. Um, so there are a couple of debates here. One debate, and this Gary Marcus is very engaged in it, is whether or not the sort of fact that these things work by deep learning, by prediction, um, mean that they're going to fall apart at a certain level. They don't create models of the world. They don't have symbolic structure. They don't have logical structures. There are certain things that in the end they won't be able to do. And it's hard to see them because they're trained on so many examples. In fact, the very examples that people use um, as counterexamples to say GPT-3 end up as part of a training set for GPT-4. So we could be a, a bit less impressed that it can handle them well. It's kind of someone is teaching to the test. But to answer your question, I think it does. There's, there's an argument that Chomsky and Chomskyans used to make, which is that there's some aspects of language that we possess that could not be learned unless we have innate language-specific structures. And yet, these large language models <clears throat> seem to possess, seems to have the knowledge without the innate structure. It seems to be an existence proof. You give it enough data, it'll just figure it out. On the other hand, and here's where I'm skeptical, Three-year-olds, four-year-olds learn to talk with amazing fluidity and a deep grasp of language and all sorts of subtle knowledge and everything. And they didn't get, I don't know what is, 50 billion sentences from the internet in order to do so. They get a much smaller data set. It's not clear then that um, it might, put this way, it might be that there's two ways to learn language, the way humans do, which will work on a very small data set and does involve innate structure, and the way these models which involves no innate knowledge, but an enormous amount. Of data. So, and if that's true, then the models don't refute, don't don't bear directly on the theory of how people. So, do. is that what you would favor right now? That there, we're just learning. There's a whole other way to learn languages. Yeah, I think so. I, th- I think at minimum, what we've learned is that these large statistical models are capable of learning and commanding domains that in some ways that bear no resemblance to how people do it. So we know how people learn chess. You know, you, 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 somebody gives you the rules, you practice something, you get better and better and better. It bears no relationship to how these models learn chess. We know how people learn, um, learn how to do uh, multiplication. 
you know, two times, you learn it, the 12 times tables, you get better, you carry this, you do this. And that. Those machines learn to multiply in an entirely different way. And it's a, it, so it seems as if there's another way to do yeah, things. Yeah, I think one way of seeing that is seeing the kinds of mistakes humans make versus the ki- kinds of mistakes yeah. AIs make. This has been one of the frustrating elements of the conversation on ChatGPT is people will point out all the mistakes it makes, but won't point out all the kinds of mistakes human beings make, right? They'll, they'll point those mistakes out as if they're a rejoinder to the idea that this has achieved a certain human level competence at, at language. When humans make yeah. all kinds of mistakes, right? We make, we make spelling errors, well, which, you know, if, if GPT were making, folks would be pointing that out. We make errors of logic all the time. I mean, there are whole fields dedicated to the reasoning errors that we make and that, you know, so, and, and you could say the same about, even the same about chess. You know, I'm, I'm like a, I'm a, a chess fanatic. Um, and, you know, on chess.com, they will have bots that are, you know, not the strongest, but are kind of tailored to be mid-level yeah. bots, but they don't play like mid-level humans. What they do is they play perfectly six yeah. moves in a row and then make an absolutely idiotic mistake that no human would make, really. Even a, a, even a much worse human wouldn't make, whereas humans make different, much more human kinds of mistakes. Um, and, and so, and yet, you know, a bot can be a, as good as Magnus Carlsen. So there can be different paths yep. towards the same level of competence at a skill. And that may be part of what we're learning here. Yeah, I think, I think I agree. I think there's sort of a bad argument and a good argument. Like you pointed out, the bad argument say, oh my gosh, you know, Chad GPT made a mistake. Let's trash the whole thing. Let's make fun of the whole thing. A self-driving car mm-hmm. got into an accident. Oh, let's don't use them at all. This is, when it comes to practical usage, those are the wrong arguments to make. You have to compare it to to mm-hmm. people. You know, I if if it turns out that self driving cars, um, you know, cause an accident one out of every million times they're on the road, and people cause an accident one out of fifty thousand times, uh, it's, it's, you just mm-hmm. you go for the proportions. You go well, what's safer. So the mere existence of mistakes right now there's countless millions of people playing with these AIs and everybody who finds a mistake goes on Twitter to talk about it. Well, you know, think how many mistakes people make. So that's the bad argument. The good argument is the mistakes they make seem to be of a different character than the mistakes people make. And from a sort of scientific point of view, that sense, that's interesting. That suggests they're doing things differently. You had a nice chess example. I heard um, uh, this, this guy, I think it was Stuart Russell, Give a Go mm-hmm. example where apparently there's a machine, there's a, a you know, this you know f- ferocious uh, AI Go player that can be fooled using extremely mm-hmm. simple tactics. That just I, I don't know enough Go, but just put like put a wall around something and just it falls apart if you just do exactly the right thing in a way nobody at that mm-hmm. level would fall apart. And as a psychologist, I find it interesting. I'm interested in people, but I'm also interested in how these strange entities work. And the differences strike me as really cool. Okay, so another question about AI and and artists. And this is brought out to me by by your, your book on how pleasure works. This is from many years ago now. But you had this thesis in that book that humans are essentialists with regard to pleasure which explains why, for example, we will pay millions of dollars for an original Vermeer, but very little money for a literal atom for atom replica, right? Yeah. Like in terms of physics, these are replicas. They are perfect replicas. Yeah. And so if it were just about the pleasure that I'm getting from atoms arranged in this way and the, the pure beauty of the painting, I shouldn't care. But I do care, right? And yeah. and that's because we feel yeah. well, Vermeer touched this one, right? And that imbues it with some essence, yeah. et cetera. And there's a lot of things you can't understand if you don't understand that principle in, in life. And and so I, I wonder about how, what this means for the future of of art. Because we are in the age now where Mid Journey and Dolly 2 have proven, I think that. AIs can create art at a human level, 
certainly can create art better yeah. than I can, actually better than most humans can, and as good as professional artists. And that's only going to get better. Music right now is lagging a little bit behind visual art, in my opinion, but I think it's very close. It's, it's going to be very close. Music, large language models, and, and so forth. I'm curious if, if, um, if you would project 10, 20 years in the future when music, it may not be that long, when music can really make the next Drake song exactly as good or, or better than Drake, meaning Drake yeah. didn't get in the studio. Yeah. All you did was put a line of text into a program and it came out with the next Drake or the next Kanye or the next Harry Styles song. Every bit yep. is good. Yep. Are people going to be interested in that product knowing mm. that it wasn't the hand of Harry Styles or Drake or whatever that, that yeah. created it? Yeah. I mean, right now everyone's going to Dolly and similar things that, you know, get me a painting of, you know, Donald Trump in New York in the mm-hmm. style of Picasso, getting new Picassos out. And, um, and I, I wondered the extent this will even happen in literature, you know, I like Richard Russo. I like his short stories. Make me another one. Make me 10, you know? Um, I think that there'll be tremendous interest in this. And it should be fascinating to have new albums by Drake that mm-hmm. aren't by Drake. But, but such that, no, you can't tell. Mm-hmm. And I don't, think, I don't think we're very far from, from that. But the question now is, what will we think about them? And I think you're right. I think there's a whole lot of... Of research as well as sort of common sense observation that finds that the source really matters and we're going to downgrade uh contributions that are not made by people because they're machine made they're 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 less intimate they're less personal and uh and so uh you could imagine in the future most most any sort of writing competition or artistic competition that's blind to uh to the contributors would say AI, no AI allowed. Mm-hmm. We just want people. Um, and this shows up all over the place. I've been reading about, about uh, online therapy. And the claim is, which I'm a bit skeptical about, is GPT does pretty mm-hmm. good therapy. But I don't think people are very happy. And there's some research that once they discover that their therapist is, uh, is a line of code, not many lines of code. So yeah, authenticity is going to take an ex- going to become extremely important. If I had to invest in a word for the next decade, that would be the word because, because distinguishing human creations from AI creations, and also, and this is our talking to Sam Harris about this, also the case of, of um, all the deep fakes that, that AI could easily create, there's going to be such a premium on some way of marking things that this is real. Yeah. This actually happened. This was not a creation. Yeah. I mean, if I use the chess example, I think chess is useful because AI has been ahead of humans for many decades now. And so we've yeah. seen the practical consequences of that. And one is people do not invest nearly as much time or money in watching Stockfish play, which is the best AI, as they do Magnus Carlsen, who is much worse than Stockfish. It's not that there's no interest in Stockfish was, games. There actually is. Yeah. But it's several orders of magnitude less than the best human players. I was going to ask you, that fits my estimation. People would care more about watching who's the yes. best person yeah. alive playing chess than who's the best right. program I mean, at, at any given time, there's a whole Twitch account dedicated to playing the best versions of various different it's a it's a computer competition an ai chess competition between different yeah. ais and it operates 24 hours a day because they don't get tired right <laughs> and i've watched i've spent probably yeah. an hour and a half of my life watching it and at no point does it really have more than 100 or 150 viewers whereas if hikaru nakamura yeah boots up his laptop and streams, he will have easily 20 to 30,000 on any given day. So I think that yeah. if that, yeah. insofar as that's a good, uh, you know, earmark for where things are going, I think that will probably hold true to some extent for music and literature. And it's also reassuring because there were predictions when, when really good chess computers came out, yeah. this is going to kill chess. No one's going to mm-hmm. care anymore. Once the best person could be beaten by any by any any good 
AI. And apparently, interest in chess has gone up. People think about imaginative variants and using AI to improve their games and so on. So this, you might have a similar thing where, you know, music and literature, poetry, whatever, um, where either there's sort of, we put, put that all aside and let humans, we're interested in what the people do, or people use AI to facilitate, to get better at it. Yep, that too. I don't know how many. I don't know how many musicians. I mean, you should, you you know more than me. Do 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 people in music use AI? So I have a friend right now who is a producer. He makes sort of the beats and the music behind songs, the 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 under um, the structure basically, and he has begun using yeah. two different AIs that will essentially flesh out an idea that he has. So he'll have a simple idea. He'll put in the basic melody, say. He'll put it into the AI, and then the AI will come up with you know, a B section to that A section, right? It'll, it'll supplement. And often he'll find, okay, sometimes it's not so good, but sometimes it actually gave me an idea with a small tweak. It, it, it could yeah. cut your work time in half on creating a song, or it could just generate lots of decent ideas that help you generate quote unquote original ideas. Um, so it's just like, it's like having a tireless assistant in a way. And it, the assistant may not be a genius, but yeah. it's tireless. So that's worth, that's really worth something. I'm, um, I'm writing an article right now and, um, and I'm tr- playing around with, uh, with the open AI GPT four mm-hmm. to say, you know, here's the first couple of paragraphs, yeah. give me a couple more paragraphs along these lines, you know, make that review right. this literature. It's very tempting. You just get, you get a lot of words oh, on yeah. the page that way. Um, the minus is it hallucinates. Right. So, so it makes up, I usually notice it makes up citations. It makes up, if something sounds yeah. cool, it puts it in. <laughs> so you have to be extremely yeah. careful. With yeah, this. totally. Um, but again, you know, human beings hallucinate false memories and, yes. and, and yes. all the rest. I've, I've hallucinated things that I thought that I read or things that I thought someone said. And, and, um, so there's that. It's fair enough in some way. This this blurring of the past is one way in which these AIs are surprisingly mm-hmm. human, you know. And and one way I've seen this put is it's almost a form that the prime directive of many of these things is basically make the user happy. So so I was writing something and I said, give me um, I like some quotes. This is when I was writing about replication mm-hmm. crisis, action in psychology. I like some quotes from some prominent people on how psychology is a disaster because of replication crisis. So it had a quote from, from uh, Nassim Taleb and a quote from Gert Gerinch. They were perfect quotes. The, the Taleb one was rude and, and, and obscene and spicy. The Gigerinch one was more thoughtful, but kind of very angry. And, and I'm thinking, this is great. And then I look them up and neither <laughs> of them existed. It just gave me just what wow. I wanted. That's funny. So, I mean, on that note, many people, especially in the, sort of rationalist community have worried that AI is going to take over the world. Elon Musk and others have famously signed a, a, a request to put AI on pause for six months to prevent a world takeover. You know, whether that world takeover occurs because, you know, the AI be, you know, actually wants to take over the world becomes conscious and like an, sort of super intelligent evil human might do engineers of the world you know like the like the plot of a very good science fiction movie or whether it's the more nick bostrom idea where the ai really has no ill will no evil intent whatsoever but we ask chat gpt or or some future version of of gpt to do some task such as, you know, eliminate yeah. suffering in the world. And it does that by killing every person in, in an honest attempt, but it just doesn't understand certain common sense human notions because it has a sort of machine-like intelligence. Um, do you worry about these scenarios at all? You know, given your, your observation that chat GPT at some level seems to, each iteration is built to please us more and more at, at some level because we're creating it. So do you worry about these scenarios? 
You know, I heard Sam Harris give a talk a while ago about AI risk, and he said, the funny thing about AI risk is you look at these other risks and of nuclear war and pandemics and global starvation and everything, they sound horrible. AI risk is so cool that it makes it difficult to sort of feel, it's so science fiction-y and everything. Um, I, I don't worry as much as most people, mainly because I find it hard to see sort of exactly what happens that leads to so much trouble. You know, I can't imagine somebody linking G chat GPT to, you know, give it the ability to launch nuclear warheads and then see what happens. You know, so what harm can it do? And the answer is you can put it on social media and it can do harm that way. Um, but having said that, I'm convinced that the odds of it doing something really bad are what, like five, ten percent, and those are huge odds. So I don't know whether the response to it is shut it down for six months. I'm not part of the problem. There is not every country in the world is going to do the same shutdown. So, that, so that there may be somewhat of a race here. So I just don't know. I'm fairly agnostic, but I don't think the shutdown people are being unrealistic. I think they're just taking very seriously small risks. Yeah. Well, I've paid attention to both sides of this debate, and um, I think over time I've come to see the critics like Steve Pinker and Kevin Kelly and Robin Hansen as as having persuasive criticisms. So to take yeah. to take, I guess, two criticisms. One, I think, is you know that the idea the idea that it's going that an AI will ever have a kind of urge to dominate or an urge to oppress yeah. or or even something as simple as an urge to survive its own termination is is falsely attributing to it human motives and this and um i mean the the reason humans have an instinct to survive is because we evolve by natural selection there's nothing about intelligence that is inherently connected to the will yeah. to survive, right? It just so happens that the same process, evolution, built both of them into us. There's no reason a machine would have that unless we programmed, programmed it into uh, it. And so, so that's sort of the easier one, I think, to knock down. And I think yeah. to be fair to the other side, I think fewer of them are compelled by that disaster scenario than by the misalignment scenario and yeah. and there there I'm less sure of what's what's worth worrying about but I think Pinker and Hansen or certainly Pinker would say by definition if we've made something super intelligent that intelligence will include understanding our implicit instructions right understanding that eliminate suffering in the world does you know, that that we also mean don't kill us, right? It will, it will, yeah. if yeah. insofar as it's super intelligent, it will, intelligence just is understanding all of those unspoken desires and commands, right? Um, yeah. So, I mean, and, and that's agnostic on whether we actually can build true, like general super intelligence. That might be a concept yeah. that... It might be an ill-posed concept in that intelligence, what we think of that as intelligence might be, oh, well, this is, this, is a, this is a question I'll put to you. What is intelligence? Like, what is this? Is this, is intelligence a knob that everyone has at a certain level measured by something like IQ? And in theory, the knob could just be cranked all the way to the right. Or is it a collection of, you know, sub skills Evolve, uh, modules built into yeah. us by evolution that sometimes all correlate in quote unquote very intelligent people. What is intelligence? So, um, so there's a lot going on here. I, I to answer mm -hmm. your last question first, I think intelligence really is better thought of as a bunch of separate knobs that can be turned, separate capacities that have different neurological ar architecture, different developmental origins, different evolutionary origins, the sort of intelligence that goes into being good at math is a different intelligence than being able to manipulate and understand people, which is different from being good with words. It so happens with people, there's sort of an intercorrelation between these intelligences. So you call them IQ or G, 
which is, you know, some people, somebody who's like 120 tends to be good at all of these. Someone who's 80 tends to be not, not as good on all of these. But it's an important question to ask because a lot of people talking about AI talk about it as if, you know, oh my God, it now has an IQ mm -hmm. of 90. You know, in a week it'll have 95, it'll have 100, <laughs> and then it's going to zip right past us. And then it'll have, and then, and then it will crush us. And that's not the right way to see it. And in fact, we already know it's not the right way to see it because apparently ChatGPT4 does, um, does really well at LSATs and SATs and the medical exam, much better than any person can do at all of them, mm -hmm. you know? So does that mean it's already much smarter than us? Well, I've dealt with it. And, you know, it's very smart at answering certain questions and also in some other ways, incredibly stupid and unimaginative. You see the sort of uh, um, disconnect between different sorts of intellectual abilities versus others. I will, however, disagree a little bit with something you mentioned and attributed to, to Pinker and Hansen and so on, which is it's true that these AIs don't have, don't typically have any desire for self-preservation wired into them. Yeah, you know, that really isn't that, that it, it's a magical thing to think that just being smart comes with it. My calculator is really smart at math. It doesn't have any self-preservation mm -hmm. instinct. However, if you give an intelligent being a goal, whatever the goal is, unless the goal is kill yourself, implicit in this is mm. survive. And there's actually been simulations finding that, that AI is doing simple goals. will stare out of trouble mm. and try to keep alive because their survival is necessary in order to do the goals. Right. So you may end up with an AI with a sort of fairly strong desire to live and not get shut off and not get destroyed just because it's in the service of right. another goal, which is made perfectly reasonable. Right. Goal. All right. So let's, uh, let's pivot from the artificial intelligences back to the, uh, well, the real ones. I'm not even sure that that, that naming is correct. Yeah. The natural, the natural ones. ones. Um, you know, the nature versus nurture is a, is a perpetual question um, that, that, and curiosity that people have. To what extent are my traits, my attributes, my personality, my competency, my skill, to what extent was that a function of the genes I was given at birth? And to what extent was that a product of the environment I grew up in as a kid? To what extent is it a yeah. product of just hard work and, and sweat equity, as people would say? What, uh, how do you answer that question um, based on the best evidence we have? So there's not, it's an important question, but it's just actually it's just two important questions. One can ask that question concerning universals that all humans have. So I'm interested in language acquisition. We can ask, what's the relative role of innate biological machinery and environment learning language? And we know it has to be both. And, you know, bricks and, and dogs don't learn language. So plainly it has to do with the fact we have human brains. But if you're raised in Seoul, you'll learn, uh, uh, mm -hmm. you know, Korean. If, if, you're, if, if you're raised in Florence, you'll learn Italian. Your environment plain determines what language you learn. So some sort of comp, very complicated combination. The question you're asking is subtly different. And it's a question a lot of people come to ask, which is forget about universals. What about differences between us? Maybe you're more extrovert than I am. Maybe I'm more agreeable than you are. And, you know, the personality. Different, um, some people are straight. Some are gay. Um, some, some are neither. Some, um, some people are very, very intelligent, very verbally gifted. Others aren't. Some people are good at math. Blah, blah, blah. Where does that come from? And that's the business of behavioral genetics, which, and it has some surprising findings. So one of which I mentioned before is genes matter for every, every trait you could imagine. Every trait that allows for variance, genes matter. For anything about, your, your, about you, which differs across people, um, how quick you are to anger, how quick you are to tears, uh, your, your, your sense of humor, whatever. If I could get your bio data from your biological mother and biological father about their own traits, I could extrapolate to yours with reasonable uh, uh, success, um, even if they never raised you. Just like if I have to ask, if I look at how tall you are or how strong you are, 
looking at your biological parents, you get some, mm-hmm. some sense of some, it's heritable. So that's like, and then people say on average, it's like 50%. And, you know, it so happens 50% is about right. It depends, depends what you're asking for. So some traits are highly heritable. Um, others are much less heritable. Um, but then where does the rest come from? Well, this is not, if it's not genes, it's environment, but environment covers so many different things. It covers um, what your mother was eating when you were in her womb. It covers whether you're bullied at school. It covers whether, whether your parents read to you. It covers um, what the language people spoke around you. And the big debate is determining what aspects of, what in, of the environment um, play what role. And the big finding is, and you've, I'm sure you've heard this before, even the people you talk to, is surprisingly how people are raised matters less than you'd expect for their personality and intelligence. If it mattered a lot, for instance, you'd expect adopted kids into a family to turn out pretty much the same as their biological, uh, the biological kids, as their siblings. But they don't tend to. They tend to be quite different in their personality and their abilities. This doesn't mean genes are 100%. They aren't. But it means that the environment that molds us, a lot of it seems to come from outside the family. So when you say outside the family, are we talking, you know, the school, the peers, the wider culture, television? Are we talking about, you know, do we know what aspects of that, I guess, what would be called the non-shared environment? Do we know what yeah. aspects of that are doing the, are, are pulling the lever in terms of the environmental component of how people turn out or is it just sort of the sum total of everything that's not your parents and household? So it's by definition, the sum total, but then of course you could ask your question. Sure. But, but, but what, what plays a role? And um, I think the answer is nobody knows. A lot of people believe, and Judith Rich Harris, who's a, an independent scholar who wrote the nurture assumption, got a lot mm-hmm. of this argument going, argued mm-hmm. it's peers. So the idea is that, that how deter- much determines how dominant a person is? Well, genes in part. But where's the rest? Well, in peer groups, sometimes people are at the top, sometimes people are at the bottom. And that sort of, tr- that sets you up for the rest of your life. So that's the hypothesis. And it, there's a logic to it, an evolutionary logic. Your personality should be shaped by the people around you. There's not a huge amount of evidence for it. And remember, the non-shared environment could be anything. It could be, you know, gamma rays. Mm-hmm. It could be. It you could know, be a random thing that happened to you when you were seven, and not your sister. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. And and all we know. So all of these measures of behavioral genetics and um, and the more sophisticated measures where they just look at a bunch of genomes or segments of genomes from a million people and just do math on them. Um, are good at parceling out what's the factor of the genes and what's the environment. They aren't good at figuring out uh, how the environment does its trick. And they also aren't good at figuring out how the genes do their trick. So it's very tempting to say, you say you find a genetic contribution to people who end up going to Ivy League schools versus who don't. And you say, oh, wow, those genes wire up people's Mm -hmm. brains to make them smarter, say. But that by no means follows. For instance, if it's easier to get an Ivy League school, if you're obedient and non-rebellious and don't get into trouble and, and pay and strength, maybe the genes code for, mm-hmm. for docility or agreeableness. If, if it's easier to get an Ivy League school, if your skin is one shade versus another, maybe the genes mm-hmm. code for skin shade. So, so, the, so genes can have their power, but through all sorts of ways. So that it would work one way in one society and another way in another society. Yeah, so I just did my 23andMe I just got my results like two weeks ago and I don't know. Have you done that? I haven't. You're the second person I spoke to who just had it and I think I'm going to do it. Any surprises? Yeah. Well, so no surprises in terms of my ancestry. I mean, pretty much almost exactly what I would have predicted given my knowledge of where my mother mother and father are from. Um, But they have this whole health section where they give you just dozens and dozens of your variant of a gene. And, you know, for, for instance, one was that, you know, 67% of people who have my variant of this gene are uh, unafraid of public speaking. Whereas, huh. you know, 33, the other 33% or 
are, yeah. are afraid of public speak. 33% of people with my variant are afraid and vice versa for the other variant. So I can read into this, oh, this, hmm. this gene is the reason that I'm so yeah. comfortable being a podcaster and people ask me to speak from time to time. And I, I genuinely don't get too much stage fright. Um, I get, I get a little bit, yeah. but you know, it defies belief for me to think that one gene could really have a deep causal connection to public speaking specifically rather than something much more general or, or something it, in any in any case, I find it very hard to believe that this one yeah. gene is actually "quote unquote" the public speaking gene. gene. I think we yeah. know enough to know that that's not how genetics works. And yet, that's right. On the other that's hand, right. it got a few things very wrong about me. The most surprising of which was that it got my asparagus pea thing wrong, which is. <laughs> I think, really? yeah, I don't know if everyone knows this, but some people, when you eat asparagus, your pee smells extremely weird and extremely pungent. It's very noticeable. And for other people, it, it just smells normal. For me, I get the pungent odor every time I eat asparagus. It's impossible to ignore. But genetically, I, I don't have the variant that 23andMe says predicts this. I have the other variant, which huh. either means they're just very wrong or it's governed by like lots of different genes, which that seems like the paradigm case of something that would be just one gene. Yeah. I, that's, that's more plausible to be some sort of amino acid gets stripped or something like that. But like public speaking, the idea of a gene for public yeah. speaking is ridiculous. So anything, well, first thing, there's not going to be anything evolved for public speaking. It would for a bunch of traits involving like, you know, more right. sociability, lack of social phobia and so on. And it's not going to be a gene. So there's these three laws of behavioral genetics that Eric Turkheimer developed. But then recently people come up with a fourth law, which is that any interesting human trait is going to be on the command of hundreds, more likely yeah. thousands of genes. There's no gene for intelligence, gene for courage, gene for schizophrenia. Rather, there's going to be a cluster of genes, each contributing a fraction of 1%, but they are, or for height for that matter. There's no gene that tells you how tall you're going to be. It's just a bunch of genes that all work on your body in different ways, together giving rise to height. Yeah. And that's kind of inter it's, it's interesting for studies that try to explore the genetic base of different categories. It's also, I think, it throws a little bit of cold water on genetic engineering mm -hmm. claims. So, you know, if you want to genetically engineer your kid to be smarter, don't imagine you're going to be tweaking one little gene. You'd say you're tweaking a thousand genes, you know, and you don't also don't know what other things yeah. they code for. So a, a friend and I were having this discussion recently, and you you just referenced this that we share on average fifty percent of our genes with each parent, and which and with each full biological sibling. And I think that number, if I'm correct, halves as you get um, to, yeah. to grandparents and to half siblings and so for aunts. Yeah. But that's that's an average, right? Which means you could share less than half your genes with a parent or a sibling um, based yeah. on how the, I, I forget what the process is called when the DNA kind of scrambles in each in each sperm cell. And I forget. I'm tempted to say mitosis yeah. or mitosis, but I there's some like you know, randomization that goes on in there. Yeah. There's random, random shuffling uh, of, of the DNA. So, but I'm not aware of like, what is the range of, of, uh, likelihood? Is it that like, uh, what's the bell curve on how much ge genetic material people like two siblings share, for example, is it like, does it go from one to 99% or from 25 to 75? Do yeah. you know that? There's enough genes that when you're going to do the math, you sh you shouldn't end up like 99% yeah. your father and 99% right. your mother. It's just you're flipping a bunch right. of coins. And so it should come out um, like for the most part, enough coins, it should come out 50-50. So, but rather than have any knowledge, I have an anecdote. A friend of mine who I talked to about 23andMe, I talked to him like mm -hmm. last week, actually another, another mm -hmm. podcaster guy, says uh, he got his ancestry and his mm -hmm. sister took it too. And her ancestry was different, but it was just because his parents are of different ancestry and she got more or less from the mother right. versus the father. So it's like, it would, might've been like 55%, 45% for one of them and 50, 50, 50 right. for the other. 
So yeah, you could one, there, there are many reasons why you're different from your sibling, but, but one of them is you just get a different right. mix, a different mix with possibly different proportions. Right. Okay. So let's pivot to, um, to, to happiness. Presumably this is yeah. something that psychology would have something to, to say uh, about. I mean, so I mean, I guess my first question is as, as an expert in psychology, do you feel, do you feel any of the insights of psychology have made you happier? Like by, by implementing no. your no. knowledge, has any of this knowledge led to greater happiness for you specifically? I think I may have become happier through reading some more philosophically motivated books um, and sources, most of them which say, don't worry too much mm-hmm. about happiness, like books about stoicism and, um, and sources about meditation and, and arguments about mm-hmm. flow by Csikszentmihalyi, which is very much of a non-happiness sort of thing. Um, the answer is, is no. I feel that um, I haven't really benefited from psychological literature on happiness. On the other hand, and just to go back to your original cynicism, I think psychologists have discovered some interesting things about happiness. You can decide how useful they are. Um, one, I'll just tell you a few. One of them is obvious, which is happiness uh, goes up with money up to a point. It'd be so strange if that mm-hmm. weren't true, since money you know, buys you food and safety and free time and travel and and good medical care in a lot of places mm-hmm. and so on. Of course, there's a diminishing returns. You know, once you have um, $100,000, another $5,000, it's not going to make much of a difference. But if you have $20,000, it'll make a huge yeah. common sense. Um, some things which aren't common sense. What's not common sense is that happiness uh, over age shows a U-shaped curve. A real surprise. So, so a guy your age, you're still pretty happy. You're going to be dropping <laughs> on Awesome. Average. Till you get to your mid fifties. Till, till you get wait, 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 good story. Till you get to your mid fifties. And then you start to creep up again and say, you. By the time you're you're like in your eighties, uh, it could well be the happiest year. Interesting. Of your life. What, why do you yeah. think that is? Very surprising. And you know, so it's not very intuitive because we know happiness correlates with health, and 80 year olds are in poor health. Happiness very strongly correlates with status. When you get really old, you don't get much status. I don't know. I'm tempted to sort of more pop cultural explanations like um, David Brooks talks about the two mountains. He says, when you're young, you're aspiring for status, maybe for sex, for money, for power. You get a bit older, a certain age, a sort of second hump. You're looking at relationships, friendships, meaningful acts, eulogy virtues, mm-hmm. he calls them. And, uh, and maybe they're more connected to happiness. So one finding about happiness is my friend Dan Gilbert said this is number one finding, is the, the biggest correlation with happiness is good personal mm-hmm. relationships. They did a study once of the happiest people in the world. They just took this, they do all my sur- big survey studies. The people who, who from scale one to 10 said I'm a nine or 10 out of happiness. From a scale of daily enjoyment said I'm 10 out of 10. And they said, what do these people have in common? And some of it is they're pretty rich, they're healthy, they're, they don't smoke. They're curious, they're this, they're, but also they say they have people in their lives who love them, that they're in mm-hmm. regular contact with. They feel mm-hmm. respected. They care for others and are cared for by others. It might be then to go back to the answer of your question, which is for many old people, not all of many old people, they have family connections, they have friend connections, and then they nurture those instead of the mad dash that maybe younger people get into to make more money, travel, have more experiences, more yeah. hookups, more whatever. Yeah, that's um, that's interesting. Uh, I, so, I mean, there there are a few questions that brings. One is this question of hedonic adaptation, which I think uh, is a it's a concept yeah. many people will be familiar with, but I think is under discussed uh, because it's it's just it's so profound when you think about its implications. It's like we spend so much time pursuing pleasure, uh, but our our internal bar for what gives us pleasure changes often along with our success at getting that pleasure. And you could, 
I mean, yeah. I, I'm thinking of Disney World just because I, I just went there over the past weekend with my friend's family who he has small children. And I was thinking about the rides that were available to me when I was their age, which would have been 20 years ago. Not that long, but like the Tron ride, for example, one of the best roller coaster experiences yeah. I've had. And they went on the rides that I liked as a kid and they were very bored by them. Right, because they have ex- they have yeah. exposure to these much better rides. Yeah. So it's it's um it's a treadmill effect where we can make a lot of progress, but not actually move the needle on how much we are enjoying something. And I, you know, another example for some reason I always think of is how fun it was to stay up late when I was a kid and wasn't allowed to. Right, like if there was one night yeah. a year I got to stay up till eleven p.m. This was like magical to me. And once I was able to do that, all of a sudden it meant nothing. Uh, and yeah. and so many things in life are like this. We you know we chase something that moves farther and farther away as we chase it. Um, I mean, what is the you know what is the proper response as a human being to the fact of hedonic adaptation? Right, like what is how should we should we stop pursuing things? Um, or, or should we just understand that we are wired to pursue things that are going to, uh, that aren't going to satisfy us when we get them and we have to just accept that we're on this sort of treadmill and just keep running? That's a good question. I read this crazy book. I won't tell you what the book is. I want to a crazy book Guy, by a psychologist described a hedonic treadmill. It says, you know, I was kind of I was married to my wife and, you know, we'd be intimate. We'd do time. Kind of got less fun, less interesting, a bit boring, a bit boring. I got a new wife. That's kind of made it more interesting. That got boring too. So I began taking on multiple partners. But pretty soon that kind of got a bit less. And so he's going through this kind of phantasmagoria of increasing variety and trying to outrun the treadmill. And this is wonderful, this wonderful image. But I don't think in the end that's going to work. I think in the end, you will, you will simply burn yourself out and run out of earthly pleasures. And mm-hmm. then where will you be? So there's all sorts of strategies to get around it. Um, you can restrict your pleasures. If there's, a, if there's a really good ice cream treat that you enjoy, don't eat it every day. If there's a musical band you really like to listen to, don't always have it playing on your headphones. You'll get sick of it. You will hold back, um, you know. The, the, the advice for a couple sex life is, is obvious from mm-hmm. this perspective. You know, space everything out. Just kind of takes a lot of willpower, but this is a way to stretch out hedonic experiences. The other approach, which I think is the right one, and I actually wrote another book called Sweet Spot, where I made, kind of made the case for this in more detail, is to say happiness in a hedonic sense, pleasure, uh, seeking out pleasure, it's great. But it's just one part of a life well lived. There are other things in life that give rewards that are different from hedonic awards. And so don't suffer so much from, from the treadmill. Like think about training for a marathon, not running it, but training for it. Not, none of it's fun in a simple sense, but there's a feeling of satisfaction as you get better and better. Um, relationships, a good, a good long friendship, good long love affair, romance. Um, the excitement might fade. But it has other values, raising children. So in some way, the answer is give up a little bit on, on the hedonic aspects mm. of life. Yeah. I think uh, I'm thinking again about this sort of U-shaped curve and our efforts to extend our lives. I mean, there's a lots, lots of money and time invested in figuring out how to get human beings just to live longer. And I think almost... Insofar as you have a good quality of life as an old person, pretty much everyone would argue that it's better to live longer, right? On almost any that seems right. Any philosophy yeah. of happiness. I'm I'm interested in why there isn't more effort uh, devoted to figuring out how to make experiencing a typical day feel longer, right? Sort of extending <laughs> life from the inside out. And there is a short passage of your book where you talk about the subjective experience of time, right? And um, I, I think it was Julia Galef who I had on this podcast uh, a while ago who made an observation that's always stuck with me, which is 
that she she often goes on small vacations and and notices when she's on vacation that time slows down a little bit and that therefore going on vacation effectively is a way of extending your life at some in, in some way whether or not that's true for for everyone it does seem like there is something to your you know how you experience time moment to moment you know if you smoke weed you find yeah. time slows down or if you do another drug it speeds up it seems like yep. this is something that maybe ca- maybe can be manipulated and to the extent we care about extending the life we should there should be some interest in you know how do you make your typical day seem longer without it becoming more boring is that possible is that is that a is that a crackpot line of <laughs> a line of reason i think that's a great question <laughs> i mean i mean you gave away the punchline yeah. of the answer which is i don't know if you've ever read catch 22 no. i read a long time ago but um but one of the characters who was terrified of dying wanted to live as long as he could before he would end he was, he was done during wartime he was a soldier on dangerous missions and so what he did was he aspired to make himself as bored as possible <laughs> Because the time would, it's like, like immortality, <laughs> the time would drag on. Now, so, so that's, I mean, that's the solution there. You got it. You want, you want, you want 10, your 10 minutes to last really long, <laughs> put down your phone, just sit, shut up and sit there for 10 minutes. This is, um, presumably you want to extend your, your time without being bored. I don't know what the trick of that is. Um, I might be smoking that's lots actually, of That's an interesting question. <laughs> um, yeah, except if you're me, then you spend all the time. Yeah, I mean, I'm exactly the same state, way. That's so. why I can't touch it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but, uh, but it's, it's, you're making what I think is a very clever point, which is, you know, longevity is, is, isn't, is properly thought of not as how much your body lives, how much your body lasts, but rather the sort of length of your experiences. I mean, while we're at it, abolishing sleep. Mm would, if it saved people a third of their lives, would give people, say, an extra 25 right. years. Well, but the problem with that is that I think I prefer being asleep to being awake. Like, it, sleeping well is one of my favorite things. Although, at some, maybe at what yes, I really... but do you like What sleep? I really mean is, like, being about to fall asleep, knowing that I'm tired and going to get a really good rest, I guess. And in, and in that case, it's not the sleep I'm enjoying. It's, like, the falling right. asleep. Yes. There's something very delicious about the yeah. feeling of being so tired and to sleep is right. Is right. It's not clear sleeping right. feels like right. anything itself, but, but, but how much would you give? And this mm-hmm. is a complicated question for the gift to be able to put your head on your pillow and deep sleep. And then you open up your eyes and you're fully refreshed and the second is gone. Yeah. I mean, that would be worth, that would be worth a lot of my money. Yeah. It would be. Although I'd wonder. It would be. In a sense, there's a feeling you'd go mad without the ability to to, sh- to really experience the nothingness mm. of sleep. But imagine we factor. No, out. I mean it'd be it'd be huge. It'd be amazing. Yeah, I mean I, I have a feeling there are some people that, by how much they get done, must be living that way. But but it's not me. Um, okay, I, yeah. I have a few other questions uh, for you before I let you go here. One is, uh, you know, I had Nita Farahani on this podcast a few weeks ago, and she has this new book called The Battle for Your Brain, where she really impressed upon me that mind reading technology is, you know, essentially here in, in certain spaces, the capacity to get an EEG scan of your brain correlated with, you know, certain words or behaviors and really read your mind to, to a degree that I think most people currently don't realize is possible. And this tech is already being used in some Chinese factories where they are hooking up workers to EEG scans and being able to see via EEG signal who is, you know, slacking off essentially. Um, are you, have you paid much attention to this and, and, um, if so, what what are your thoughts on mind reading technology? I haven't paid much attention to it. The mind is the brain. So there's no in principle reason why an fMRI machine or an EEG machine can't in some way capture the going on of the mind at various precisions. And there's been some clever studies, for instance, which have people 
look at a screen and then there's an fMRI scan and then it could capture in almost an individual image what the person's mm -hmm. been looking at. You could imagine conceivably being able to e eavesdrop on people's dreams that way, assuming the visual cortex is, is let it's it's is activated in this. But I don't know. I mean, so far these are gimmicks. They're sort of they're they're actually some one I, I can't resist this wonderful case of this where people in comas who were who were in locked in syndrome, I talk about this in my book, who were thought to be vegetables. And so so um so psychologists put them in an fMRI machine and start talking to them and says, if 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 you hear what I'm saying, imagine playing tennis. And then like then the motor cortex would light up as if you're playing. Yeah. And through this way, they could communicate with people mm -hmm. locked in syndrome. So that's sort of mind reading technology. I have a tremendous spoon. When it comes to sort of dystopian things, I just, I, I think it's all possible in principle. Before I believe in the specific cases, I'd like to see sort of serious peer reviewed articles. This area has so many people making extravagant claims, often companies, often people with a lot of mm -hmm. uh, skin in the game. And, uh, and so I have nothing against idea and principle in practice. I'd like to see, um, I'd like to see yeah. critical scrutiny. Okay. A few other questions here. Um, one about mental illness. We've talked about happiness. Let's talk about the, the other side of psychology, the dark side of psychology. Um, you know, it, it seems to me, you know, we have the the DSM manual, which categorizes all of these mental illnesses. You know, what, how do we even define a mental illness, right? Because this is, it seems like, uh, I'll just put what I, what I worry about on the table. One is, mm -hmm. there's a certain kind of mental illness where the, the symptoms would be a detriment any person in any society, right? Like, yeah, like, re paranoid yeah. schizophrenia, um, major depression. Like, there's no human society, yeah. barring crazy thought experiments, where that set of symptoms would be good for the person and good for the people around them. But when I think of something like ADHD, you know, I, I think I know people who have the symptoms of, of quote unquote ADHD, but in a you know, in, in certain contexts, those symptoms seem to serve them very well. Um, you know, so, but you put that person, you ask that person to sit in a classroom for six hours a day and, and suddenly they're a very poor match for their environment. But then that same person yeah. becomes a brilliant musician, has no trouble focusing on something they really, uh, you know, on practicing their instruments, say. And ends up having a very successful career, a, a rich social life, and no symptoms of or signs of, of mental illness or, or deficiency. Um, so I, I kind of wonder, like, what is the criteria of w by which we separate, uh, let's say, like a neurodivergent but perfectly functional yeah. type of person from someone with a quote unquote mental illness? Yeah. I talk about this in my, in my second to last chapter and, and it's a, it's, it's a matter. Psychologists and psychiatrists who work on a DSM and study this, they aren't dummies. So they, they sort of appreciate these are really mm. hard problems. And so there are the things, and this is where I part company of neurodiversity and kind of agree with you, you know, paranoid schizophrenia, um, major depression, bipolar disorder, uh, serious social phobia, obsessive compulsive disorder. Um, there's only things which are horrible to have. Like, I think schizophrenia is a disease like cancer. It, you know, it, it destroys people's lives. It leaves you unable to function. It leaves you at the mercy of others, dependent on others, it leaves you miserable. You know, it, it's under any notion of what an illness or disease is, it's that. But then you have all of the more difficult cases. So severe autism to me is a disease like that. If somebody is just it needs to be protected from harming themselves. They can't speak. They can't, they can't act in a coordinated way. But what about people with Asperger's syndrome who do speak, but they're, maybe they're, they're, they, they seem to act in ways that the neurotypical people view as odd or focused on routine and so on. Um, and 
horrible anxiety where you can't get out of bed is terrible. But sometimes in some circumstances, a little bit of anxiety, maybe a lot of anxiety, just the thing. I quote a, an, an evolutionary psychiatrist, uh, Nessie, who says, you know, people with too much anxiety, you see them in psychiatrist office. People with too little anxiety, you see them in prisons and morgues. So, you know, so, so the right amount of, so you're right. There, this, there is, there's, and there's no, there's no simple answer. Oh, here's the cutoff. Particularly since a lot of these things are on a continuum. And, and we sort of are, we, we decide on where to cut off is as society. And in the end, I think this is not just a psychological problem, it's sort of a moral problem and a political problem. To say, where do we say, where do we say, okay, that's just a person we don't like, a personality type we don't like. Call him a narcissist, you know, uh, call him dependent. But that doesn't make them ill versus when do we say now it's stepped into illness and now your insurance company could pay for your medications, you can get treatment of this sort and so on and so forth. Um, it's, it's a difficult problem. And, and, and then there's other issues, which is to what extent do you grant free choice a role? Like, so I think there was a debate over sex addiction and they said, no, we're not putting that in, but alcoholism is in. Yeah, no, I mean, it's, it's so, so interesting it's because like hard there's tell. a part of me that says, well, who doesn't like sex, right? So how can, how can, you know, like, and, and there's a famous cliche about men thinking about sex every seven seconds, which is definitely not true, but, but also directionally accurate in some way, especially, uh, you know, pubescent, uh, puberty aged boys and, and, and so forth. So, mm -hmm. But then there's another part of me that, you know, I've really... I do, I have met people that are fixated on sex to a degree where it, it's like half or more of their life is devoted to the direct pursuit of sex. Yeah. Right? And it's like, you, you can't talk to this person. You can't have a conversation with this person for 10 minutes without them texting their tonight's hookup. Right. It's like, yeah. and that seems to be really, really actually abnormal. Um, and so that's, that's, that's probably one of the toughest cases just because it's, it's like, it, it's, it's something we all do want, but has been taken to an extreme, um, in, in that particular person. So one measure which applies for these things, um, is I'd be very unwilling to call this an addiction, whatever you want to call it. I mean, we don't call this a mental illness or something that needs treatment. If the person who's addicted is happy, flourishing, mm -hmm. and does well in life. Okay. Just a different way of living. You know, I might say, dude, you think too much about sex, but you know, mm -hmm. who am I to say? On the other hand, if they're miserable, if it's destroying their lives, if they themselves seek treatment, that's kind of a different story. Right. I mean, one, um, one thing I worry about here is, you know, like I get, I'm, I'm constantly getting these ads on Instagram for quote unquote adult ADHD. Just, you mm -hmm. know, every other day I'm getting ads to take thesis or whatever, like whatever, some product. I haven't looked into it, but they, I, I'm, the algorithm is clearly told thesis that I'm, you know, a prospective buyer. Yeah. I'm not a person that, you know, my capacity for focus, it, it can be dependent on how interested I am, but I got very good grades in school. Um, you know, I'm, I'm by no means an ADHD candidate, I, I think, but I do feel constantly distracted, right? I, f I like almost yeah. everyone I talk to feel constantly distracted. I go to my computer. Welcome yeah. to our century. Yeah, you know, I go to my computer to do one thing and my fingers type in Twitter before even I, I've decided to do anything. And it's 20 minutes later and I meant to respond to that email. That's the whole point of why I came to my laptop and I still haven't done it. So that happens to me regularly. Yeah. And I feel, you know, I, I worry about the incentives of this because there's a lot of profit and money to be made in convincing someone like me that I have this thing called adult onset ADHD and it's not, yeah. 
social media and smartphones, it's just, you know, it's just something I have and I need to be medicated and I need to pay someone for these meds. And, um, you know, I worry about that phenomenon right now that we're convincing people they have mental illnesses that are really just a product of the way society is, is structured. There seems to be two separate questions here. Um, one question is, and I got it, it should review what you have as an illness because you're distracted by Twitter. <laughs> this seems pretty, pretty plainly not. Um, what about a kid who can't sit still for, for eight hours straight in a classroom? Same, same deal. This is not what we're, this is, these are weird things the world imposes mm -hmm. upon you. And, and, and then they call you ill mm -hmm. if you can't do it. This mm -hmm. sounds weird. So I kind of agree with you. I think there's different cases in schizophrenia, mm -hmm. and depression, and so on. But here's the second question. Suppose it wasn't framed in terms of an illness. Suppose somebody was offering you these pills. You want to increase your focus? Mm -hmm. Take these pills. There, I don't, I know some people have a moral objection the people using medications to get better in some way. I don't quite have it. When I'm sleepy, yeah. I drink coffee. When I want to get relaxed, mm -hmm. I drink whiskey. If I was to add some sort of Adderall to the mix, I'm not sure there's anything in here. No, I don't think so either. I, I mean, I think if you don't object to caffeine, um, you shouldn't object to re really, in principle, any other drug. But I think often maybe that objection can mask the fact that so few drugs – work for lots of people, right? Like caffeine seems to work for yeah, like most people. The side effects are not so bad relative to what it gives you. Adderall I've done many times, but I don't do it because the for me the the come downs are so bad. I become very irritable and very yeah. short tempered and it should that's yeah. it's absolutely not worth the focus that it gives me. Um yeah, so Let's see if I have any questions for you before I, I let you go. I guess I have one one last question because because you are a psychologist and this um, this question is very interesting to me from a psychological perspective. Is this this concept of social contagion, right? And this is this is um, m most talked about now with respect to the issue of uh, transgender identity. Uh, but mm -hmm. it's actually much larger than that. It's just a general phenomenon, right? You have instances where a whole school will get hiccups, right? At the same time, and yeah. they'll see if it's the water supply or uh, or something else, and it just turns out that it's spread via social contagion, right? And it's not a biological cause. You have there was an Atlantic article last year about TikTok Tourette's. Did you see this? I've yeah, so it was that, a, yeah. just an outbreak of Tourette's-like symptoms and doctors were racking their brains trying to f find out what has caused this sudden uptick in Tourette's. And it just turns out all their new Tourette's patients followed TikTok influencers that had Tourette's and who made these very compelling yeah. videos letting the world in on their Tourette's symptoms. Very interesting content but then gets wrapped up in all these influencers having millions of followers and kids wanting to yeah. be like them. And this goes back to the very beginning of our conversation, the, the unconscious mind. The kids coming into the doctors with Tourette's, they weren't putting it on in a sense. They weren't frauds. Yeah. It was, they really felt they were having these symptoms, but upon closer examination, if they're if they're made to realize that it's a product of the TikTok, the symptoms actually can go away. Yeah, really. Yeah, the symptoms can go away. Like if if they're made to realize that their the path their path to, the path to their symptoms is not the same as the path to uh, that that a typical Tourette's patient would have. So, I'm curious if social contagion is something you as a psychologist have looked into if you have any general commentary about it as a phenomenon and if you have looked into it at all with respect to the issue of the, the uptick in transgender identity among teenagers, especially girls. I haven't at all. It's just, I, I know a lot of people are talking about that, but I haven't, I haven't looked at that at all. I more generally, 
um, I'm very interested. I study moral mm -hmm. psychology and a uh, sense of right and wrong, um, different aspects of behavior in children and adults. And th th there's an extremely important and maybe rather obvious insight, which is we're social creatures. We pick up in a million ways what other people mm -hmm. do. And, and we're focused on one of two things. Either if everybody's doing it, we'll do it. You know, have, you just put, you, if you're in a place where people are talking in a certain way or walking in a certain way, pretty soon, if you're a normal person, you'll start doing that yourself. It's just, and if you know it or not. And then the second thing you focus on above and beyond the groups is status. And this is the, the TikTok people, which is that if there's people you recognize as high status, you'll be driven to copy them and emulate them. Now, to me, it's an open question to Tourette's or whatever, to what extent you could explain it in those terms or other terms. But the idea that we are very, very, that we, that social activities are contagious, everything from COVID masking to wearing a hat seems to be, you know, a, a, an undeniable truth about our minds. All right. Uh, Paul Bloom, thank you so much for coming on my show. And once again, the book is called Psych. And I highly recommend it to anyone interested in the human mind, which is probably everyone listening. Um, besides that, is there anywhere else that my listeners should go to follow your work or your musings or anything else? Um, I got a website at paulbloom.net and uh, a Twitter, Paul Bloom at Yale. All right, perfect. Even though after tweeting a lot recently, my, my Twitter account has not gone up. So I'm blaming this on Elon yeah, Musk. I don't see your tweets. I think I follow you. There we, there we go. I'm shadow banned. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, don't end perfect, on that. <laughs> perfect. All right. Thank you, Good. Paul. Thanks a lot. Great talking with you. That's it for this episode of Conversations with Coleman, guys. As always, thanks for watching. And feel free to tell me what you think by reviewing the podcast, commenting on social media, or sending me an email. To check out my other social media platforms, click the cards you see on screen. And don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. See you next time.